Hey there, uh -huh. Thank you so much. So um, I'll just say good afternoon to everyone. I was knocking on the wrong Zoom door earlier, so apologies for arriving a few minutes late. Um, and also thank you so much for including me in this um, and, and bringing us all together. So I'm a behavioral scientist and I've had the pleasure of working quite closely with modelers for the first time ever through the COVID-19 response and my role with uh, SPI-B, which is the behavioral uh, science uh, branch of the SAGE response. Um, and so I'm just going to talk a little bit about why behavioral science is important to think about during extreme events, to understand um, behaviors, and also think about the ways in which we have brought behavioral science um, into play with the modeling discussions um, along the way. So I'll give you some examples. I've front loaded this uh, probably a little too heavy. I keep on removing slides and then putting them back in. Um, I can always share papers, but I won't cover every single example on the slides. They're there, I know, because the slides are going to be shared. So I'll just say that my colleagues and I have a lot of experience in, in terms of thinking about behaviors and extreme events. We draw from a very long standing and extensive risk literature, risk perception, and risk communication, and behavioral literature. Uh, and we tend to apply that to low likelihood but high impact events. So, just some of our projects around chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear terrorism. And we were able to use this um, to think about and analyze uh, the Litvinenko response, the uh, Salisbury response, for example, flooding and conventional terrorism, pandemic, um, ad, acid attacks, um, and different forms of terrorist attacks as well. So I can talk about a lot of these, but I'm going to focus much more on COVID-19. Before um, moving into the examples of our engagements with, um, with our modeling colleagues, I'm just going to set the scene a little bit for those of you who might not be familiar with behavioral science um, and just say one of the pathways that we use to think about the behaviors that we might see during extreme events is really to think about the ways in which members of the public perceive the risk or threat, but also perceive the response organizations and the response as it unfolds. And this really started off uh, a long time ago. I was already working in this area as a, as a postdoc, but one of the moments that really changed the government appetite for thinking about behavioral science and extreme events was the UK Blackett Review for High Impact, Low Probability Risks. And they argued that for many high impact risks, we do not understand what the public actually expects in a situation or how tolerant they may be of abnormal risks during a crisis. And I would say that that holds true um, for, for many events, but the evidence base is growing. Sometimes we do have the evidence base and we do have all of the lovely reports that um, we feed into the system, but when a response takes place, it can be difficult to actually ensure that they know where that information is and they're able to draw upon it. So sometimes it feels a little bit like um, we're recreating the wheel during different responses, but not all of the time. You can see you can see the knowledge and the interest and the appetite changing over the years. So when we think about this as psychologists, we very much recognize that fear is a health risk and that risk perceptions inform behavior. And we recognize that implicate that this has implications for physical health as well as emotional health. Um, some of the work that we've done and that colleagues uh, or colleagues around the world have um, have done or undertaken is uh, looking at the spontaneous behaviors that individuals may engage in, which can actually lead to higher risk during an extreme event. And there's a really good study um, after the 9-11 attacks from Gergerinzer and colleagues looking at it's called the drive versus fly study where the spontaneous avoidance behaviors that they were looking at were members of the public taking to the roads. So they, they had this increased perception of risk from flying because of the hijacked airplanes, and therefore they were driving longer distances, um, and they ended up actually having more accidents. So they estimated that this move, the spontaneous avoidance of flying and move to driving longer distances, driving overnight, making journeys that you normally would have taken a short hop on the airplane for led to an additional 1,595 road traffic fatalities in the year following 9-11, um, the 9-11 attacks. So it really can have an impact if people change behaviors uh, because of that perceived risk. We also know that public behavior, of course, driven by perception, can impact the effectiveness of healthcare systems. 
And we've seen this, we have so many examples, I, I'm just listing a few in, the, in this bullet point, but I'll focus in on the Tokyo sar sarin attacks. And one of my colleagues, Luis Lemire, a Canadian colleague, argued that 5,510 of the, those who flooded hospital emergency departments were psychological casualties. That is, they experienced physical symptoms without direct exposure to the nerve agent. So they were having symptoms, and they they did have they did experience symptoms and the impact of this attack, but they weren't actually exposed to to sarin during the attack. If you put that in context, the 1995 Tokyo sarin attack saw 500 injured and seven dead. But because of this perceived risk, because of the belief that they were exposed, the health system had to deal with 5,510 individuals. And you still, you still need to have the capability and capacity to triage them and, and to address their concerns. So I won't go into all of the examples. I'm happy to chat about them along the way. Um, but we really, really look at communication as a tool, a very important tool for informing risk perception, which of course informs behavior. So we experience a number of challenges when we try to communicate risk and try to realize protective health behaviors during an extreme event. And one of the main challenges is the variation and expert and public perceptions of risk. Um, pandemic influenza has been up there if you look at line four and see um, influenza up at the tip top on our national risk register for many, many years. And I remember as a young academic when they were first going to actually put CBR or CBRN attacks in on this. And, and that's, you know, that's down here, around three, I think it was, in terms of the likelihood of occurring an impact. And so we, we were prepped for this. There were all kinds of discussions, lots of concern about putting this out. And, and I actually, you know, did full makeup. I got, I got dressed up for the day because I thought, this is my moment. I'm going to end up on BBC News or something like that, speaking about CBRN, which was really my focus back then. And the, the um, media went with pandemic influenza, which of course was up in, uh, at the top in terms of likelihood and potential impact. But that really ebbed away. And, and so most of the conversations have been you know, behind the scenes in terms of emergency planning. We have seen this change over time. Um, and we still see, if we look at most risk registers, that um, pandemic is up at the top in terms of likelihood and impact. But when you ask members of the public what they're actually worried about, we see them worrying more about, let's say, for example, attacks on publicly accessible locations, which is quite quite far down in terms of um, in terms of the overall impact on on members of the public. And we also know that when we think about experts, um, we have to be very careful and and clarify who we mean or what we mean when we're thinking about experts. We had some work uh, funded by De Deloitte looking at critical national infrastructure resilience. And so we went out to individuals who worked in critical national in infrastructure industries, um, and we really asked them uh, how willing, not just how able, but how willing they would be to report to work under a range of different scenarios. Because if they're not going to work, then our critical national infrastructure has the potential to collapse. And you can see there's a great deal of variation in that we did have pandemic flu here in terms of um, only 55% were saying that they were willing to go to work. But when we actually broke this down, and um, this was one of my PhD students, students Lorna Riddle, who, who was just a joy to work with. When we broke that down, we also saw a great deal of variation in terms of focus group participants. The, the other table was survey participants. These are focus groups. Focus group employees who reported they were willing to report to work during a deliberate, so this was a deliberate release of pneumonic plague by sector. And you can see a great deal of variation with the financial services possibly not coming out, smelling like roses in this table. Our work did show that there was, um, that there were a lot of reasons underpinning that, including they didn't realize the importance of their, their role in keeping, uh, keeping society going. They didn't understand that really that they needed to go into work because you know, they're dealing with transactions and money. So there's a lot that we can do in that area to increase, increase these intentions. And we also know that, um, that the ways in which we ask questions, when we ask questions and, and the, the individuals that we ask 
will give us different perceptions of the risk of, I'm always circling terrorism because I quite often look at terrorism, but terrorism or how important they think the issues are. So healthcare systems, if you look at the table on the left, came out pretty, pretty well in that one with terrorism quite far down. But then if you ask it in another way and look at international security, you can see terrorism quite high up and then other um, things in terms of man-made disasters, et cetera. So it's really how you ask the question, who you ask, when you ask it, and what's going on in the world that can influence these, though we do see trends and know where to where, where most of these will fall across different populations. I think it's also very important to say that when we speak about the public, there isn't any one public, there's no single public. And this is um, a survey, a YouGov survey, um, that download, so I downloaded it on 2604.21, asking individuals again about the most important issues facing the country, so that's the UK. Um, this ended at 19th April 2021, and you can see how it changes if we're looking at all adults, and then if we start digging down and dropping that down and breaking it into 18 to 24, it really goes down from 52 to 44%, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we have so many different factors that we need to think about when we're thinking about audiences, be they professionals or practitioners, or be they members of the public and which public. And no matter how you slice it, if individuals have expertise in this area or they're seen as experts and they think that they're doing the responsible thing if they are communicating about a risk or threat, we know that they quite often base those communications on quantitative factors. So can I identify a clear cause and effect relationship? Can I quantify the amount of harm? Do I suspect a hazard? Members of the public are very interested in knowing that that work is there and, and, and seeing the numbers. And there's an entire field of study around how to present numbers, really communicate numbers to members of the public. But they're also and often more interested in these risk perception factors. And quite often, it doesn't even have to be accurate information. It's a combination of what they've learned, what they've read, what they've seen in movies, what they've um, experienced or the experience of friends. And it's whether or not they perceive exposure to that risk as being voluntary or involuntary. Is it something familiar? Do they believe that they have control over it? Or do they trust the individuals who are supposed to have control for over that risk, managing that risk? So there are a number of different factors um, there are extensive studies that also go into the nature of scale, proximity, duration, and we are always, always focusing on the level of trust in the authorities. Another challenge that we see when we look at national risk planning assumptions is that emergency planning assumptions are often inaccurate when they think about public response or represent public response. And we see that translating into the exercising as well, especially if they're contracting in actors and scripting them in terms of that response. Hollywood can come into play. And there was an exercise several years ago where one of the um, actors got a little carried away and punched a fire officer. So um, they often fail to incorporate human behavior. They can be based on contradic contradictory assumptions where they assume panic. And I could populate this with quote after quote after quote, but then if you see the responders in their uniforms that suddenly everything's okay and you follow, uh, you do what they're saying or do what they're asking. But we do have overwhelming evidence to suggest that people become interdependent and cooperative and that while panic does exist, it is incredibly rare. And there are usually a number of factors that come into play if we're going to see pa panic. We also know that assumptions of panic can lead to a focus on reassurance and we really, really urge um, organizations to understand public response along a spectrum where under response can be as problematic as over response. And we saw this with swine flu, where we had quite low levels of engagement in terms of hand washing and other protective health behaviors. Now, I have an eye on time. I've got a little secret timer here, so I'm not going to go into all of my examples or explanations about what the public will do and why they will do it. I want to move on to principles and thinking about modeling, but um, I will leave these slides here just to, to um, say that, again, panic is rare and we see a lot of cooperation um, and a cooperative behavior. So there are a number of theories underpinning this work and as a behavioral um, scientists, it quite often feels like when we join projects or, or send information up to government departments, they sometimes think that this is market research. 
and it couldn't be further from the truth. It's really, really helpful if we can engage before um, a communication campaign goes out to think about the behaviors that we want to see and the behaviors that we really want to see people avoid in order to, to de-risk the situation or to protect themselves and their families. We're quite often brought in uh, a little too late to do a lot, um, but my colleagues and I do enjoy um, looking at campaigns. So if, if, you, if you look us up, we've published around assessing and applying these theories and methods to the Run, Hide, Tell campaign, the See It, Say It, Sort It campaign, Remove, 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 and, um, and others, and looking at how we can make those campaigns more effective. And we quite often start at the far right of this model and we think about the behaviors and quite often if we ask organizations what behaviors do you want to see what behaviors are the behaviors that are going to help us get control of this situation and this is why i love working with modelers because they actually can tell me the behaviors that are quite effective that they need to see and that they want to see the protective health behaviors and we can work with them to make it to increase the likelihood of individuals engaging with those behaviors or, or, um, or carrying out those behaviors. And if we work left, we actually look at how motivated they are to engage in those behaviors. Um, and, and you know sometimes people just don't want to or they can't. We have to, we have to accept that. If we work up to the left hand side and look at threat appraisal, we break that into whether or not they perceive this to be a risk or threat relevant to them or to their families or to their loved ones. If, for example, they believe in climate change, but they think that it's going to happen to someone else somewhere else, they're less likely to perceive that as a threat. And we also consider how rewarding it is for them to engage in protective behaviors. The most important part of this entire um, model here and where we quite often target our communication efforts is really looking at the coping appraisals. And that's really where we can take, in, uh, take into account the perceptions about the event, the efficacy of recommended behaviors, the ease of recommended behaviors, the cost of recommended behaviors, and also the level of trust in those who are communicating. And we can ask people about how, how easy it would be for them, let's say if we had a chemical incident, for them to shelter in place when they know that their children are at school. And even though, even though we make it very clear that they could potentially expose their children, that, that desire to go and gather up their children and take them home is incredibly strong. And if I went into our chemical incident emergencies toolkit work, I could show you that they, they give us really, really high levels of intended compliance or in, intended adherence. But once you factor in all the other behaviors that we know that they engage in, such as collecting children or nipping to the shop for some milk, if they're gonna have to shelter, need a cup of tea, et cetera, um, we see that that really decreases quite significantly. So yes, they intend to comply eventually, but there are other behaviors that we need to take into account. And we have many, many studies that we use this model um, to underpin. I'm going to move over to COM B again with an eye on time and just really think about um, this is so PMT protection motivation theory was the previous model and that's one of the models that underpins COM B and this is the capability opportunity motivation and behavior model and it's a theory of behavior which really really uh, provides insights about the interactions between an individual's capability opportunity and motivation to engage in protective health behaviors and we think that and we know actually that capability can be psychological so do they actually know do they understand the risk or threat it can be physical if we think about hurricane katrina and asking individuals to to evacuate do they actually have the physical capability to do that or even the financial resources to do it opportunity can be um, social so what are the societal influences on that front and you can think about walking into a room where you're the only one wearing a mask or being on the train and there are there's not a lot of mask wearing going on at the moment it can it can be quite uncomfortable or physical so what are the environmental resources that are available um, to en enable them to actually engage in the behaviors and finally motivation can either be very quick and automatic so quite an emotional response or reflective so based on long-standing beliefs and intentions and we can we can apply this model and we have applied this model um susan mickey is uh one of the, is the creator of this and it's a very very popular model that we apply across a number of different settings 
So if we think about principles and the ways in which we've been applying this with our modeling colleagues, um, and I'm just giving myself a few more minutes here to stay with and, and still leave time for a few questions. Um, in terms of the epidemiological modeling principles, it was, it was quite simple. We, they were saying we need to reduce the number of contacts, re reduce exposure of vulnerable groups, and reduce the probability of infection as well as the number of susceptible people. So as behavioral scientists, we said, okay, great. How can we maximize the effectiveness of the above? So we're taking a very clinical model, a very health-based model, and we're saying, um, thank you, modeling team. This is really, really helpful because we're not epidemiologists. How can we make this more effective? And so we started looking at and drawing on our evidence saying that guidance and communication around this really needs to provide a credible rationale for the guidance and any changes to the guidance. So tell people why you're asking them to do it. Don't just ask them to do it. If you need to ask them to do something else, tell them what's changed and why you're asking them to do it and how effective that is likely to be. It needs to engage all sectors of society and that involves co-creation um, and going out, especially to those seldom heard populations and the populations that we traditionally know um, and, and health psychology are more difficult to, re to reach and, and working from a grassroots level and a community level on up rather than a top down level. And also enabling changes and providing support. So can we use organizational structures and processes? Can we give guidance to organizations to help them think about shift patterns, the ways in which they can keep their environment safe, breaking into teams perhaps so that the teams don't meet? Um, can we think about things such as providing um, funding if we're asking people to isolate at home, um, if they're worried about losing their jobs, not being able to pay their mortgages, et cetera. It's much, much more challenging. Um, and really thinking about how to redesign environments. And so we've, of course, we revisit this time and time again, and this is even getting older. So we, every time every time we're asked to and given an opportunity to, to we, re, we revisit this and re-emphasize a lot of the core messages coming through, but also tweak it as we move forward. Um, we've also, through working with the modeling team, we've been able to really take that very, very physical health-based model and start thinking about uh, the wider impacts of the health interventions that we're asking individuals to, um, to, to take part in and to get, engage in. So it's not just about infection and controlling of infection, it's also thinking about the educational outcomes in schools, in this instance, the health, well-being and development, thinking about social inequalities and, and, um, and comparing remote learning versus at-home learning, et cetera. So it's really, really increased our ability to have broader conversations about those direct health impacts as well as the indirect health impacts. And I won't go into all of the um, higher education. I have tried to cover too much and I apologize. I, I spent ages adding in, taking out, et cetera. But we've really, really worked with the modeling teams around um, test and test trace and isolate with the um, looking at the environmental model, uh, modeling group and term, monitoring group in terms of thinking about airflow and then working with the behavioral scientists and the modelers. We've looked at return to campus in terms of universities. And you can see with the bottom ones identified the barriers to student engagement with testing. So we can definitely, definitely work on communication around that. And we have made many recommendations about the types of support packages that can be put into place. So we, we can give almost fill in the blank guidance based on our collaborative efforts where they can create their own guidance and they can create their own packages and adapt their practices in different organizations. And it helps them explain to their staff and to their students, et cetera, why they're asking individuals to actually engage in these. And finally, I'm just going to end on this slide and say that when I think about working with the modelers, um, it's, it's really been, it's been such an in interesting process because I hadn't had that opportunity before. I almost don't know how to proceed in my future work without having a modeler to speak to or someone to reach out to. And I really think it's important to have that upstream dialogue if we can before extreme events take place because that's going to create an understanding of the tools that the modelers and the behavioral scientists are using, the measures 
the evidence base that we can bring to bear and the evidence gaps between us. And I just think that all of our projects would be much more targeted and much more effective if we're having those conversations further upstream. It worked well in, in, in the moment and we were all working through the night, we were all coming together, but some of my favorite work during the COVID response has really been where we weren't working separately to the modelers, that we came together, we discussed the problem area and we decided a way forward and figured out how our pieces fit together from the outset. Also, uh, behavioral science and shape, and shape is, um, is uh, the, the catchy new frame. Uh, it's not quite as easy as STEM, but it stands for social sciences, humanities, and the arts for people in the economy. Um, when we do bring these to bear on modeling, we can add nuance and bring detailed understanding about shared and varied behaviors within and across communities. And the modeling assumptions, can, uh, modeling processes can also help us if we understand the assumptions that they're making, we're saying, whoa, I've seen a paper, I've seen a study on that, or we are not so sure how that's going to work. And we can actually go and, and run an experiment and run a study to, to bring greater certainty to those assumptions. The processes and really understanding the modeling needs can, can influence and inform our research. And, and finally, I think that working with the modelers um, will help us as behavioral scientists or shape in um, academics uh define our interventions and target these interventions and once we have started putting these interventions into place the modelers can also help us understand the impact and test and monitor and finally i think that we have the potential to save lives by building partnerships further upstream but also ensuring that those partnerships are there during an extreme event because we're only going to make one another more effective at what we're doing and it's it's really about helping helping the other the other set of skills understand the angle that you're bringing in understand where you're coming from and believe me that's going to change once you start having those conversations across the boundaries so i will end on that and stop sharing my screen and just say i'm so excited about this workshop and i love seeing how you're bringing all these worlds together and um, i've absolutely loved working with you and i hope that we carry on in the future Thank you so much, Brooke. That was brilliant. Um, I'm going to go straight over to questions because we'll just give a couple of minutes for this. Um, actually, Brooke, it'll be good to know, will you be around for the discussion session at four? Or, or uh, I'm so to... sorry, I'm not. Uh, I, I have to go um, into London. I actually had this in my diary for this morning. Yeah. And so I apologise. So I, I've shifted things around for the afternoon. Okay, well, in that case, if anyone has any pressing questions, please do raise your hand. Okay, Flavio, um, yeah, please go ahead first. Hello, thank you, Brooke. There was a fantastic uh, introduction to your, to your field of research. There's just one thing I, I thought was interesting. You, you mentioned that um, uh, was it the financial sector was less likely to show up to work, and then government and the healthcare workers. Now, what struck me is that, in some sense, that's exactly what we would want to happen, right? If, if there's an immediate health crisis, it would be much worse if the healthcare workers and government people stayed at home, but all the, the city types were going to work. Um, I when the, that research was undertaken, we hadn't quite moved into Zoom land, et cetera. Um, so I, I will have to go back to the dates, but um, Lorna, my PhD student, now works for the cabinet office. So, you know, it's, she's well into her stride after that work. It is what we would have expected to see back then. I will say that those are intended behaviors and the reality of intention is uh, a complex process to actually understand in terms of the real behaviors. Um, it, we do need the financial services to carry on though. So we were looking at critical national infrastructure organizations. And if you think about the impacts of not being able to make transactions on our food, on our electricity, on our energy, on trading, et cetera, we do need at least a certain percentage to go in to keep everything running. We can work more remotely nowadays than we could back then. But when we actually interviewed the leaders of these organizations, the managers, the assumptions that they were making about the level of staff who would come in and that they needed to come in um, weren't based on any evidence at all. And we would say, well, why do you think they'll come in? How do you know? And they go, yeah, it seems like it's quite a positive thing. We worked with Deloitte. They have a great, a lot of experience with, for example, Hurricane Sandy. And they gave us examples of members coming in and sleeping on the floor, staff members coming and sleeping under desks. 
but that also, yes, they're dedicated to their jobs, but they also had heating and light at the office when they did at home. So there are all kinds of dy dynamics to consider, but we do need a critical mass to be there in order to keep all these systems running because if the financial services aren't there, we won't have food, we want, you know, we, we are unlikely to have transport, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Is there, are there any other questions? Um, please do raise your hand or, or leave them in the chat. We, have, we can take another one or two, I think. Okay. Um, I can't see any hands raised. Um, so I think, thank, uh, I'll stop and say thank you, Brooke. Um, for that wonderful talk. It's really um, great to have you here and to have you with us. Um, and yeah, please do feel free to join the discussion sessions either today or in the future sessions um, and, and we can carry on this dialogue.